because I'm a recruiter, I get to listen to everybody's story that comes in. And it's probably one of the best parts of the job is listening to young adults to, you know, grown men and women uh, tell me why they're doing this. That's my, usually my first question. And a lot of times it's, it's um, a sense of pride. It's a, uh, a sense of, of wanting to serve the country that's given so much to them. I grew up seeing my grandfathers on both sides, pictures from, you know, when they enlisted in the military. And I always said, I want my picture next to theirs. Welcome to Homeschool Talks, a podcast by HSLDA. This is a show about all things homeschooling, from practical tips to inspiring stories and everything in between. This episode of Homeschool Talks features a conversation originally hosted live on our Facebook page. So if you like what you hear, be sure to follow us there for more content like this. We're so glad you've joined us today, and we hope you enjoy the program. Hi, everyone. We are so excited for this conversation today. We will be speaking about military enlistment. Serving our military is such an honor and a privilege. I'm biased about that, though. So as a recently retired Naval chaplain spouse, thanks so much for joining us. And my name is Natalie Mack, and I am the Military Outreach Coordinator at HSLDA and a high school educational consultant. I'm also, as I previously mentioned, a Navy chaplain spouse. I am also a homeschooling mom of five. Four have graduated and gone on to college. Woo woo, I'll have to celebrate that. And graduate school, and I have a current ninth grader at home. So, to all of my fellow um, military homeschooling families joining us, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Like I said, there are six branches of service the Army, the Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and our newest, Space Force. So there are several ways to enter military service with enlistment being one of the primary entrances. So our guest today is Nathan of the Homeschool Project podcast. He is a military recruiter, a Coast Guard recruiter and homeschooling dad. So you will get two perspectives, which is awesome. I heard him speak on another dynamic podcast, the Homeschool High School podcast with the Seven Sisters. And when I heard him speak, I knew I wanted him to be a guest. And now the time has come. Nathan, so excited to have you here. Would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself, your family, your podcast to get us started? Sure. Well, thanks for having me, Natalie. Um, So my name is Nathan Romeo. I am, like you said, a a Coast Guard recruiter up in Ohio. Um, And I've been in the Coast Guard for about 12 years, going on 13 here in April. And we, my wife and I have homeschooled for the last three years. And a little backstory about that, I guess, is we, I had asked my wife if she was, uh, wanted to homeschool, if she had ever thought about it. And she said, no, you're crazy. (laughs) I'm not homeschooling. And she was, she's a registered nurse. Uh, we were living in Florida and she was working full time. I was obviously working full time and, you know, a little time went by after I had asked her that. And one day she, she said to me, I think I'm ready. And that was the day that she came home. We both got home late from work, picked up the kids from daycare and school. And that day, the first time she saw our youngest son was when she was bathing him right before we put him to bed. Wow. And she said, this is crazy. This is not how we envisioned raising our kids. And a lot of it had to do with running around with daycare and school. And, and so we both sat down and and from that day, it took a whole year because my wife's a planner, right? So it took a whole year for us to take the next step, but she ordered books and went to the library and every day I'd come home, she'd have books spread out on our bed and she did her research and by the next year, she was ready to go, and she was confident and uh, about about doing it. And we've we've homeschooled since then, and it's been a blessing. It's been amazing. Obviously, there's ups and downs, just like anything. It's not always easy, uh, as everybody knows at homeschools. But the time that we get to spend with our kids now is amazing. There's so much quality time, and as you know, as a homeschool homeschool mom. Uh, you know, the things that we get to do with our kids 
instead of them sitting behind a desk all day at school versus her taking them to all the amazing museums and libraries and uh, other, uh, you know, places that this area, especially Cleveland has to offer. It's been, it's been amazing. Um, and in the meantime, while we were doing this, we felt there was a, there was a, the way that we homeschooled, the way that we thought about homeschooling wasn't, and it probably existed, but we couldn't find our representation in the podcasting world. So we said, why don't we start a podcast? And that representation really is, you know, we, we love to travel. We, so we talked to a lot of people who homeschool their kids all over the world who <laughs> do it um, on the road, who live in other countries, you know, part time and then travel to different countries and the entire time they're homeschooling their kids or they homeschool their kids on farms. Right. That's what we're interested in. And we couldn't find that. So we decided to start our own. Right. And that's what you do. If you can't find what you need, you do it yourself. You do it yourself. Exactly. Do it yourself. So now we have the homeschool project podcast and I've been did that for, we've been doing that for several years. We took a break recently because we were working on something else um okay. on our off time but we love doing it and it's been amazing talking to the different people in the homeschooling world and all if if you're not homeschooling right now and you're scared about starting some of the people that we talk to will give you the confidence because what if they're if they're doing it and the way that they're doing it is possible then you can do it and that's what and that's why we love doing it because it gives us confidence as well and it gives us motivation Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's such an awesome story. I just love, I love, love that. I wanted to say that I had prepared a series of questions for you. And as I was thinking about them, I was thinking about us as, a, for example, I'm a high school educational consultant, as I mentioned. And some of the questions that we get as we advise and consult parents and homeschool teens about what's next, because college may not be the next journey for all high schoolers. We know that. And so, but military enlistment is a frequent, a frequent path, a frequent journey. And so we get lots of questions, uh, you know, in the consulting department about transcripts, our free transcript reviews that we offer, GPA calculations and curriculum. And then we have the military service questions as well. So we're going to get started. Okay, Nathan. So sure. Big question. What are some of the common reasons that young people want to enlist? So it's a very personal thing. And because I'm a recruiter, I get to listen to everybody's story that comes in. And it's probably one of the best parts of the job is mm -hmm. listening to young adults, to, you know, grown men and women uh, tell me why they're doing this. That's my, usually my first question. Right. And a lot of times it's, it's um, a sense of pride. It's a, uh, a sense of, of wanting to serve the country that's given so much to them. Exactly. Um, and I always like to tell people, if you don't understand what this country has given you, then you have never left it. Yeah. Until you've seen other yeah. countries, you don't understand yes. what you have here. And so that's a very important. So true. Yes, very it true. is. And um, a lot of times it's a, it's a family thing, right? So their mm -hmm. dad served, their mom served, their grandfather served, their grandmother served in, in some aspect, you know, somewhere down the line. Right. And they want to be able to put that same uniform on that their family did. And right. that's very important. A big part of that was, that was my story, right? My grand, I grew up seeing my grandfather's on both sides, pictures from you know, when they enlisted in the military. And I always said, I want my picture next to theirs that I have to oh, have my that's picture. Oh, so awesome. There. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So that that's was important to me. A lot of people important. come in and they want to go to school for free, right? They don't have money for school and they know that the military will pay for it. Right. And the military understands that. And that's okay. They know that like, hey, if, if this is the reason you're coming into the office, then that's okay because this is what why we offer it, right? We offer this to people so that we can get people into the military. And then you know, on the, on the other end, we put out edu educated civilians. So yeah, it's a very personal thing and it's going to mean something different to every single person that walks into our office or is considering joining. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. I love that. So, so what are the differences then? Cause we get this question and, and those like you have the military uh, family background. Okay. And I'm a, you know, retired Navy chaplain spouse. So I get it. 
But many times you have the family with the teen who has a desire to serve, but there's no military exposure. There's no military background. So they don't always know the difference necessarily when you talk enlistment or you talk ROTC or you talk the military academies. You know, can you kind of give us a little bit of what the difference are in kind of layman's terms? Sure. So, um, Enlist, enlist. So if you're coming out of high school, you're seven, 17, 18 years old, you're going to be enlisting if you want to uh-huh. come into the military. Uh-huh. Um, that is that is and that's basically an entry entry level coming in. It would be a I mean, you don't have to be 17 or 18. You can be depending on what service you can be older. But without a college degree, that's where you're going to be coming in. OK. Um However, in this day and age in the military, a large portion of enlisted members have degrees. So that is a that is a very old school type of thinking like, well, I have a degree, so I'm going to be an officer. The enlisted force now is highly educated. That okay? is an excellent point. Yes. 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 Um, and now you have then you have officer candidate school, right? So officer candidate exactly. school is typically going to be for people that have a degree or are working professionals. So it depends yeah. on what program that you are are putting in for right so if you're uh, if you are a physical therapist then you're a working professional and you can apply to ocs programs or we call it direct and there's going to be like direct commission right you're already a working professional like your husband Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was a Mm -hmm. a chaplain right so he Mm -hmm. came in as a chaplain because he already had those skills and that background right right Right. um exactly so every branch is going to have a different type of entrance to come in as an officer, whether it's because you have a degree or it's because you um, are a working professional in some type of field that they need. Uh-huh. Then you uh-huh. have, like you said, ROTC. So obviously there's ROTC in high school, really great program to get into starts, you know, starts getting your children into discipline and respect. However, they do not have to follow that path once they're done. You can just do it for that reason alone. And it's uh-huh. great. Uh Um, If they don't follow the path, it doesn't matter. Now, when you come into, if you decide to go to college and enter an ROTC program in college, you can be an ROTC and never go in the military. Or there's, there are programs, the part of the program where you get picked up. And then when people talk about scholarships, right? ROTC scholarships. Right. Once you have college paid for, for you through the military, then you will be finishing your program and entering into the military as an officer. Right. Right. Just what I mentioned, my husband. Yes, exactly. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you need to look into the different programs early. If the ROTC is something that you're interested in, it has nothing to do with us. It has to do with a typical, um, like, well, the Coast Guard doesn't have ROTC program. So I, okay. You want to, you want to look for, yes, we do not. So you want to look for a specific college that has that type of program and then start talking early to people because you need to get into certain courses and get in at a certain period of time, or there is a, there is a period where it's too late to turn that into a scholarship and into military service. Wow. Wow. Awesome. I didn't know. Now you have the service Academy. So every, Uh every branch has a service Academy. Uh It's a, it's college, right? So as a a recruiter, I have nothing to do with a service Academy. If you want to, your your child wants to go to a service Academy, you go, you apply to that, like you would apply Uh to a regular college. Uh That being said, Uh these are the, these people are cream of the crop, whatever that means. Right. So that's going to mean at least on paper, they're looking for, and I said, and I say that because we see applications for everybody and, that comes in either, you know, through OCS or pe- we do have people call that want to go to the service academies and we get to see their resumes. Um, and then we send them on their way to go talk to the, you know, the Coast Guard Academy. They want to see like a, a, a well-rounded person. Everyone that's applying to that, that has a chance is going to have great grades. So that's right. That's, that's a given point, right? It's a given. Exactly. So they want to see what type of person you are outside of school. What mm-hmm. volunteer activities are you doing? Who are you helping? Are you that uh-huh. type of person? You, are you a giving person? Are you a, a, a leader in your community, uh-huh. at your school, uh-huh. sports, whatever it is? Uh-huh. That's what they want to see. So if you're interested in going to a service academy, you should have been preparing that. You should be preparing for that in high school. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. I love it. So would you say the process is different for homeschooled high schoolers since that's the community we are uh, uh, our audience right now, would you say that this process would be different for a homeschooler? So 
Um, I can only speak for the Coast Guard because I don't know what the uh, the rules are with other branches. For us, the only thing that a, ho a homeschooler that make that makes a homeschooler different is they they used to require a higher um, ASVAB score. Okay. They've gotten rid of that because, to be honest, every homeschooler that I've dealt with has one of the highest ASVAB scores that I've gotten. Yeah. I was and, that's, say that's that. a, that's, and that's the whole office. Anytime a homeschooler comes in, the majority of the time they have some of the highest ASVAB scores that we get. Wow. So I think they Great. realize that and they, they don't need to check. Uh, right. they, don't need to, <laughs> yeah, they don't need to worry about the ASVAB score being higher anymore. Awesome. What they do require is uh, some sort of diploma because uh -huh. we, because they have to, they have to, sh we have to show that you've graduated high school. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. So everybody else shows us a high school diploma as a, uh, as a homeschooler. We, I know I, re I realize that we have had the kids, you know, talk to me and they're like, Hey, I don't have a diploma. As we know, a lot of times you make your diploma, right. And uh -huh. um, that will suffice. And I've had, I've used letters from the, um, the state. A lot of times the state has to, you know, approve of the graduation. Uh -huh. You know, like New York is one of them because I have to deal with people from New York up here. And so they got a, um, a letter from the school district saying that they had satisfied all requirements. That was fine. Okay. So that's really the only difference. Um, I know that the, I feel like the army at some point was giving out bonuses for homeschoolers. Oh, nice. I, yes. And I don't know if they still are. And these things change constantly with what the needs of the services are. So they, that it all changes. But as of right now, at least for the Coast Guard, there's nothing different whatsoever. That's great. That's great to hear. And that's a good point that you made that things do change based on yes. the needs of the, of the, of the military, of the particular branch. And so flexibility is always key. Um, and that's just something that you have to anticipate and be prepared for. So that's a good point to make sure that our audience hears that. So say if you have a high schooler who um, may be thinking about enlisting, maybe thinking about military service, what are, what are some questions or thoughts or things that they may uh, need to ask themselves about whether military service is for them or not? It's a good question. So obviously the military is a different lifestyle. It's a different type of job. And you have to realize that when you come in. However, it is not necessarily what you imagine it's going to be. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I mean then, either way right? right so everybody pictures an infantryman in the army is what the military is that's not yeah. what a good majority of the military does there are there's every job imaginable in the military as you know uh -huh. your husband's uh -huh. a chaplain and uh -huh. so it depends on what your interests are and all it's which will which will push you into which which service you are interested in as well because every one of us has a, a different set of jobs. Uh -huh. um, you need to ask yourself what you're looking for in a job, uh -huh. in a uh -huh. career, or your future. So the military is not right for everybody. I will. I'm a recruiter, and I will tell somebody point blank that I don't think this is right for you because that's the last thing I want, or the Coast Guard wants, is somebody here that doesn't want to be here because he uh -huh. makes a terrible uh -huh. employee, right? Uh -huh. Just exactly. like anywhere. Um, so you need to ask yourself, are you looking for a little bit of adventure? Because regardless uh -huh. of what you end up doing at some point, at least in the Coast Guard, you're going to experience some adventure more than likely. Uh -huh. That was a big part for me. And I had a career before the Coast Guard. I joined late. Um, are, are you wanting to, do you like to travel? Because even in the Coast Guard, most people think we don't go anywhere. We, we travel the world. You know, we are worldwide. So uh -huh. Do you want to travel? Do you want to be sent all over the globe and see different places and meet different people in different cultures? You'll be able to do that. Um, it's a great way to. It's a way great way to do that. Um, it, it just it really depends. You want? Are you looking for training? You're looking for education because we do offer all that. You get lots of training, and you do get like we spoke about the GI Bill, right? So you, you get your uh -huh. you get your college paid for if you if you join. Um, and it's just, it takes some, it takes some thought. You should start thinking about this prior to graduation. I mean, you can, obviously you can come in later and, and join, but I, I, I think a really helpful thing is to go speak with somebody who was in the military and ask them how their experience was, how they enjoyed it, the goods and the bads, 
because there are both just like any job, there's goods and bads. Right. And, you know, speak to the people who have done this and yeah. then start your own research, right? You need to do your own research. Right. Don't listen, to, don't just listen to other people, right? Uh, don't you, Speaking with prior members is great, but it's, then it's time for you to sit down, open up Google, and start doing your own research on the different branches, what they have to offer, what military life is like. I mean, you can find anything online, right? So start right. talking to, see what people have to say, see what the military has to offer, and then make an educated choice and decision. I, I you know, I, I really respect you saying that because for so long, there is the myth that if a young person wants to enlist, if they go to speak to a recruiter, the next thing they know, they're just, they're just pulled in and they are signed up right. and off they go. But what I hear you saying is so appreciated and I respect you for that because um, the, there's lots of questions young people have to ask themselves and there's a lot of research to do to determine, you know, is this, is this journey, is this path for you? And if so, what branch and what are you looking to get out of it? And what can you offer as well, right? Because what can you offer the military community? I'm a proud, yes. you know, retired Navy chaplain spouse. I mean, everyone's not pro-military, but, um, you know, defense of our country, we can, we, we all respect the need for the military. And so is this something that you would uh, do well. Is this is this going to be for you? So I re I definitely appreciate you laying that out and encouraging young people to do their own research. And so yes. that's awesome. Yeah, that goes for anything in life, and I think that's a lost art is doing your own research and not just listening to what the internet has to say. You know, and 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 <laughs> pick your resources wisely. Um, yeah. You know, and, and what you were saying about the mill like walking into a recruiting office and uh, you know. It, that's now I'm not saying that never happens, but that is something that happened a long time ago. Yes. We would get in a lot of trouble if we were <laughs> flat out lying to people or, um, you know, having them sign paperwork to join the military. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. We right. don't do that. You don't, you know, yeah. You don't mislead people. No. And so, no, no, yeah. that's the last thing we want is somebody to be in the military or in the coast guard. And, you know, for, I can speak for myself in the coast guard that's a disgruntled person because they were lied to that. That's, that's the worst employee you could possibly have. And they're going to be useless to any, any unit that they go to. We don't exactly. do that. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I mentioned that as a myth, obviously, you know, I don't, I've not seen that and don't, and don't, perpetuate that, but that is a myth that you often hear. So I'm glad that, you know, I just wanted to bring it out like the elephant in the room. It's like, okay, is this, you know, can, can military recruiters be trusted? And I know that they can be, and I see and respect obviously what you are saying. So that's, that's really great. Now, a lot of young people are looking at military service, looking at enlisting for the financial benefits. So are there financial benefits of enlisting and what does that look like for a young person and for the, the families that are probably the homeschooling mom and homeschooling dad that's, that's listening to us speak today? Uh, when you say, when you, when you say that, do you mean just monetarily or do you mean benefits and all all that come with it? Yeah, monetarily and benefits in general. We can expand it to, yeah, benefits in general. Sure. So I, I can pretty much tell you that if you come in as a 17 year eight or 18 year old out of high school with zero life skills, pretty much, yes, you're getting paid more than you would anywhere else, regardless of what you may think you're worth. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people say, "Well, that you don't doesn't seem like you make much money." Well, um, you're coming into an organization with no skill whatsoever, typically, right? As a seventh mm -hmm. year, and that's fine. That's that's normal. Mm -hmm. You get paid pretty well. Mm -hmm. That being said, depending on what job you do, there are bonuses that come along with that job. I mean, the Coast Guard. If you come in with, uh, at the minimum, uh, um, an AA. Uh, in some sort of culinary arts, the Coast Guard will pay you $40,000 to be a culinary specialist, which is like a chef in the Coast Guard. $40,000, <laughs> you could get that coming out of high school if, if you, or, you know, out of having two years of like community college or something in the culinary arts. That's a lot of money to anybody, never mind an 18 year old. 
right. um, $40,000 bonus. Right. Uh, now you have, now you have education, right? So you have, um, you have the, G, the GI bill, right? So anybody that comes in is typically, unless something weird happens, is going to earn the GI bill, which pays for, they say 36 months of education, which they say that because you're supposed to go to summer classes, right? So it, it means mm-hmm. it'll pay for mm-hmm. a four year degree. Right. Um, so, and it's the the highest in-state tuition of the state that you're in. So here wow, would be like awesome. Ohio State, right? So yeah. not, not private, not private. Right. Um, no. Excellent education. Uh, exactly. So Ohio State, you could get out and go to Ohio State for free. You get book stipends as well as E5 BAH, which is the, nobody nobody knows what that is. Basic mm-hmm. allowance for housing. So they right. get, you get money for housing that while right. you're going to school and using the GI Bill. It's amazing. Not and bad I'll, at all. I'll, Yes. And I'll tell you one of the biggest issues we have when people come in, you know, you have to, you can't have too much debt when you come into the military because- there's a concern for, you know, you having a government credit card at some point. Right. And the the vast majority of people have extensive school loans. Right. Exactly. And as like, if you came here two years ago, you know, before you spent all that money and didn't earn, and you didn't earn a degree, you, you could have had it for free. Right. You know, you right. have paid for that for free and been debt free. So it's a huge deal. It's one of the, I mean, I don't know where else you can go and get your college completely paid for other, unless you're a, you know, D1 athlete or something, but uh, it's amazing benefit. And, and um, it's such a viable option. Definitely. When you, you mentioned D1 athlete and even with D1, they don't all get offered a full ride athletic scholarship. So uh, this is this is great. This is honorable. This is great. Yeah. On top mm-hmm. of the GI Bill, you get tuition assistance as a as a member, which is and that amount changes every year, depending on what the government says is allowed. Uh, mm-hmm. But you get a chunk of money to spend on education. And you don't touch your GI Bill. Be, and so you can take courses throughout your career using tuition assistance and earn your bachelor's degree without touching your GI Bill. Right. And then you can use your GI Bill for a master's or and the, the new one you can actually give to your kids and your family. Exactly. Exactly. So the other thing is that um, the tests, the ASVAB, mm-hmm. everyone talks about, oh, the ASVAB, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm going to do well on it. Do I have to take it? How in the world can I be successful with that? What actually is the ASVAB? Those are some things. Can we talk about this ASVAB test, please? Sure. So it's, it's, uh, let me read it because I'm going to screw it up if I don't. The Armed Service Vocational Aptitude Battery Test, right? So that's what it stands <laughs> for. It's a standardized test and it's required for entrance into the military. And it kind of just gauges where you stand with your, you know, ed- educational level. And uh, there's different sections of it. And uh, it, it, that part depends on what jobs you qualify for. Uh-huh. Okay. So in every service has a different minimum score just to come in. And then after that, your score, it, it, that determines what jobs that you can do in the military. Uh-huh. So I printed this off just so you have an idea of what's on the ASVAB. So you have general science, arithmetic, reasoning, word knowledge, paragraph comprehension, mathematics, knowledge, electronic information, auto and shop, info, mechanical comprehension, assembling objects, and verbal ability. Now, that being said, what really counts for your the, um, the uh, meat and potatoes of your score is arithmetic mm-hmm. reasoning, word knowledge, paragraph comprehension, and mathematics knowledge. Okay. 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 Those are the really important ones, which is stuff that you're teaching your kids if you're homeschooling anyway. It's basics. It's the basics. Right, right. Okay, and how can a can um, two things? One is how can a student prepare for it? And on most installations, there's an education center, right? That mm-hmm. uh, you military and families can go to. So is that an option to maybe consider to find out more about the test? Or typically, it won't be an option for the people we're talking to right now because not mm-hmm. in the military. So you right. can't, okay. you know, you can't get into those parts of the base. That's right. That's right. If you're not a member, right? That's right. Um, however, military.com has at, has practice ASVAB exams. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. You go there, you can take practice, practice ASVAB exams. If you Google it, a free ASVAB test, it's going to come up uh, all different places. Okay. And a recruiter, one, if you speak to a recruiter, we can send you practice tests to prepare you to go take the exam. Okay. And you can retake it. Okay. All and right. so if you're taking it and a lot of high schools offer it, and I don't know if um, some places would offer it to homeschooling families, but if you're able to take it through a high school, you can use it. Um, depends on, you can't be 16. You have to be 17 when you take it for it to be valid. And it's only good for two years, two years. Okay. Um, <laughs> but it's great if you can go and take it and start um, getting ready for it and mm-hmm. uh, kind of see where you're at. And if you need to work on certain sections and, Speaking to homeschooling families, we like to utilize libraries and do some do it old school sometimes. Typically at a library, they're going to have a ASVAB study guide. What type of careers can a young person have in the military? Anything. Anything, yeah. Anything. So depend, and, and that's where when I said it depends, you really do your research to see which service is right for you. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Because each service offers something different. I've, uh-huh. I, as a recruiter, I've had people come into me and they're, they, they want to be in the medical field. Uh-huh. We uh-huh. have health, health, health technicians that work at our clinics. Uh-huh. However, if you're, edu- if you have a bachelor's degree or master's degree in some type of medical field, I'll tell them to go talk to the Air Force or the or the Army uh-huh. Uh-huh. or the Navy even. But they have entire hospitals on their bases. If you really want to dig in into the medical field and you're already highly qualified, and I, I, I probably, as a recruiter, I probably should say that, but you should probably go talk to the other service. I want to put some, I don't want somebody to come in and and be disappointed, you know, in, in their job, mm-hmm. especially if they're highly qualified for something. Like, let's put people where they belong. Right. The, exactly. Let's put people where they belong. And, and, you typically, I used to live on the Air Force Base, which you can do that as a member yeah. of the Coast Guard. <laughs> I live in the Air Force Base. And, you know, they have entire clinics and hospitals, and that's where certain people need to go if they have the skills set. So, yes. Okay. It, so, Coast Guard-wise, right, you can be you can be a chef. You can work as a health, health services technician. You can work as a mechanic. You can drive boats. You can uh-huh. be an electrician. You can be um, a welder. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, you can work on aircrafts. It doesn't matter. You can work behind a desk. If you like doing paperwork and administrative, you have administrative skills uh-huh. or, or you enjoy doing that in general, we have a job for that too. It, it just, and that's what I said when people has a, have a perception of the military yes. and an idea of what the military looks like, unless you've already spoke with somebody, you know, you know, for sure what the military is, you're probably wrong. Right. The military right. is a, an entire, it's an, it's, it's a microcosm, right. Of, of everything else around us. It, we have everything that the outside world has, but it, and yeah. it's this little, this little snow globe, right. We're all contained yeah. in the snow globe and anything you want to do, if you go to the, I mean, the air force has veterinarians, right. Right. So it just depends on what you're into. So don't think the military doesn't have something that would interest you because I guarantee you it does. I can't think of a job or, or an interest somebody would have that doesn't exist in the military. You can be, right. a, com- you can be a, 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 a gamer. It, you, there's a job for you that is very similar to what you like doing. Uh-huh. There is. And that's where the military is going anyway is electronics and IT and computers. And, and so, the, yeah, there's, there's something for everybody. And like you said, you take, you know, you, you join, you enlist and you get these experiences. So you get, you get, you get training that you can take out, like you said, and become the educated civilian, contribute to the workforce, contribute to your community, Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, be a homeschooling dad, right? (laughs) Um, Right. You can do all these things you can, and the benefits are, are incredible, to be able to have that exposure. You get the opportunity in many cases to travel. Sometimes deployed, you don't maybe want that type of travel, but you do get the opportunity in general to move around, to see different parts of our country, to move overseas and experience that possibly. 
there's there's so many benefits to it and you are so right it's a microcosm the, the there are so many that when i speak to families who are not military even if you just look at an installation many don't have any idea of what an installation is like on the you know when you come through the gates right that we have in most places, not all bases, but in most places, you have a hospital, you have the commissary, which is the grocery store, you have the exchange, which is the like a, the Walmart Target. version, yeah. Target, right? <laughs> <laughs> you have a bowling alley, you have Burger King, you have Starbucks, you have all these things. And so you really don't have to move, like don't have to really do much off post per se. No. Um, so it just varies. But these are just great, great perspectives to consider when a young person's looking at military service. Now, parents, though, get a little antsy, a little anxious sometimes. Um, you know, they worry about, is this the right choice for my young person? So, and many of them, many parents, like we've talked about, haven't served in the military. So, the military life can appear real daunting and uncertain, a bit scary. Right now, you know, we got things going on. You know, we always have things going on, whether we as citizens are aware, but there's always conflict, right? So there's a great purpose for our military to continue to keep us safe. But what what would you say maybe are some things that a parent can think about in terms of supporting a young person's decision to consider military enlistment? Sure, and that, and that fear is normal. So that's a normal thing. I was, I mean, I was nervous when I came in yes. and I was, I came in older after I got to college and my parents were nervous for me. Yeah. It was, I, wasn't, I wasn't 17 years old. <laughs> it's a normal thing because we all have a perception of the military that typically isn't correct. I'm right. not saying it's not a scary venture and I'm not saying you don't do, go do things that are out of the ordinary and dangerous. Right, right. I'm not saying that at all. However, if your if your child has an interest in this, uh -huh. or, or like I already said, let them do their research and uh -huh. do the research with them. Yes, look into the different services. Look into the jobs that are available. Look into what the benefits are because there's inherent danger with lots of jobs. Uh -huh. And and I'm not saying that. The, and again, I don't want my words taken out of context. I'm not saying that the military is not different and unique with uh -huh. some of the dangers that we have to deal with. Uh -huh. um, but I think with anything with a with a child is you have to let them go down that path and see where it leads. Yeah. You being next to them is not a bad thing. And you doing the research with them is not a bad thing at all. Uh -huh. Let them let them take the helm, because a lot of times we have people we have people come in and it's the parent that's more interested in them joining the military than the child. Uh -huh. It's very obvious, like the, the, the child, and I say the child, but you know, the, right. the person that wants to enlist, they're not asking any questions. The parents asking all the questions and the, the, the applicant isn't doing anything on their own. Right. And then we, have to, we have to pause and be like, look, I'm not, I'm not asking you to join the military. You guys came in here and it's your, your child that says they have interest, but it doesn't seem that they do. And then we, that's when we ask, why do you want to join the military? Good. Well, if they had done this research prior to, we wouldn't be having that conversation, right? Right. So do the research together. As a homeschooling family, mm -hmm. we all know how we are and that we're very involved with our kids' lives, right. which is a great thing, which is a great thing. Yeah. And you just because you do research and just because you go talk to a recruiter does not mean you have to join the military. And that goes, that's any job. Just because I go research what it's like to work at IBM or Microsoft doesn't mean I'm going to, I'm going to have a job with them or that I'm even want, I, I'm going to end up working with them. So true. So true. Yes. And that's, so when you're doing what, what do most students do? Because this is what they're told that this is the path to success, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you need to research your colleges, mm -hmm. which colleges you want to apply for. We'll take that same determination and look at the military mm -hmm. in the same light, right? Do your research. What does what do they have to offer for you? And just because you go to the military does not mean you can't don't go to college. Exactly. It's, it, it's not a black and a white thing. It's it can be both, right? right. It can be military and college and debt free. Right. So 
that, that I guess that's that's all I would have to say is I understand why somebody would be nervous. I understand why somebody would be afraid, especially for their child. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, but if you if you stop them from chasing any dream, regardless of what it is, that's going to be a problem down the line anyway. Yes. Right. I agree. And, yes. So you you have to let people be adults, and you have to let them run down those paths and find out for themselves what's important to them and which path they want to take. And then you're, it's okay to be there and point out maybe an inconsistencies or, Hey, you might want to look into this. Right. But there's only so much you can do as a parent once they hit certain, a certain age. Right. Yeah. You know, and um, we've had people come in and they come in later, later down the line because of the, what you're talking about. They were, pushed away from it. And then they come in as an older adult and wish they had joined. And they, they, they feel like they never, they never got the feeling that they were looking for, which is a sense of pride uh, and doing something. And now they regret it. And sometimes it's too late because they're too old. And it probably started with the situation you're talking about is they weren't allowed to at least, at least follow the path to the point where they can make a decision. Exactly. And information is so accessible. I mean, this podcast and you being our guest is definitely a resource here. Um, You know, like we say that I guess it's probably a verb now to Google something. So go Google it. (laughs) There's the military.com. There's so much information out there. And it's important, just like you use the analogy of researching for college, it's important to, to, to research different paths so that you can have the information that you need to make the decision that you are going to be able to live with the decision that's going to give you peace. Once you, because once you sign up, you need to be able to say, this was my choice. That's right. And I came into, and I chose Coast Guard. I chose Air Force. I chose Marines for a reason. And, and this is because of my research that I did. No one wants to get into a situation and start to flounder and feel lost and wonder, how did I get here? You don't need that. In the military, like you said, as a recruiter, in in the military, they don't don't want people who just come in and not understanding what they're coming into. They want someone Mm -hmm. that's coming in ready to get to work, ready to take advantage of all the military can provide, the experiences, the exposure, and ready to be an asset, ready to be part of um, making a difference, right, within the military community. Nothing's perfect in our world, period. We aren't as people. But if you can be part of making things better, then I think you're, you're ahead of the game. And so I, I appreciate all that you, your perspective and everything that you have shared, because it's so, to me, very valuable. No, oh, thank you. Very valuable. Um, I wanted to also make sure that I say that as an educational consultant in the high school department, we have a full staff of consultants from pre-K to 12th. We have several that specifically work with high school. And so definitely, if you are a member or you're considering membership, uh, helping young people make that decision and to where they want to go. And even prior to that, like we said, helping parents pre-K to 8th you know, on up, we definitely would love to assist you. And it's one of your, it's part of your member benefits to contact uh, the educational consultant department. So I just wanted to put that out because we do help young people with that, you know, preparing. We don't do the preparing in terms of aspect, but we help with the resources to find what they need. And we help with transcript reviews, which are free and things of that nature. So I just wanted to get that out. So let's go ahead and look at some of the questions that are in the chat. I'm gonna start at the top here. Cheryl Childress, thanks for joining us. I wanna know what the military looks for on a transcript when I graduate my child. I don't know, uh, Nathan, if you can address that at all, cause I don't know that you see that side. So if, if you're talking about enlistment, the yeah. all of the military is looking for is a that you've graduated. So a, a, de, a diploma, not a degree. I'm sorry, a diploma. Right. Your transcript does not matter. We will never take a transcript unless we cannot get a diploma. And we're like, well, do you have your transcript so we can prove that you graduated high school? Uh-huh. Um, because if you if you don't have a high school diploma, that typically means 
most you have a GED and then it does change things. If you have a GED, you have to have higher scores on the ASVAB. Um, okay. So you don't have to worry about your transcript. You just need a, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're here for the whole thing, but it, some sort of diploma. And I was telling Natalie that sometimes I've had, uh, excuse me, homeschool kids that like, I don't have a diploma, man. Um, I'm, I'm homeschooled. And I said, yeah. well, go make one because that's what, a lot of, you know, a lot of times that's what we do, right? You just, you right. have to make your own diploma or a letter from if your state requires that you go through them to uh, prove that you've completed everything that was necessary to graduate. Yeah. I've used letters from the state saying, hey, they've, they've checked every box to graduate from homeschool. They're good to go. That's what they're looking for. Okay. And in reference to the diploma, as members of HSLDA, those that are members, and one of the benefits is our awesome store. So we do have diplomas in the store. So definitely, if that's something that you are looking for, don't forget that that is one of your benefits as a member to contact the store. There is a cost for the diplomas, but it is a service that we have. And Kim Cruces, thanks so much, Nathan. Appreciate you sharing the wealth of knowledge today. I'm not sure if you mentioned it already, but what is the name of your podcast? Can you share just a little bit about that and also any closing uh, encouragement or any closing remarks, Nathan? About my podcast? or Yeah. Or what? Yes. I see the link is posted here. We did post the link, but just a little bit about your podcast. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. We just, we, I, we, I think I mentioned this when we first started, but my wife and I had started it because we didn't find anything that was, that fit into our perspective of what we wanted out of homeschooling. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, we, we interview a, a lot of different people. We've had, we've interviewed a lot of different people. We've interviewed, um, Dr. Peter Gray. So if you like, if you like, you know, speaking to, you know, uh, academics, and we have that. Uh, we've a lot of authors, but we then we, what I'm really, what I love doing is interviewing people who are, you know, homeschooling is kind of all already alternative, but we love going down the rabbit hole of people who travel the world homeschooling their kids or, you know, road school their kids or raise their kids on a farm and homeschool. That's what interests me because if those, to me, in my mind, if those things are possible, then all the issues that families have because people are you get two spouses working. There's and just the reason we started homeschooling was because that we weren't spending enough time with our kids because we were both working full time. Those things can be figured out, and the the possibilities that that you can have for your life. Are just amazing and when you hear these people's stories about you know the same thing i just i hated my job we just this is not what we what we imagined and they started doing some online work and hit the road and for the last three years they've been traveling the united states with their kids staying at state parks and educating their kids that way or we talked to a family not too long ago that was in costa rica and then you know over i forget where i'll say it ben but just all mm -hmm. over the place a family that was uh, from Aus excuse me if I get this wrong, Australia maybe, but they came mm -hmm. over here and drove the um, drove from uh, up uh, northern states all the way through Central America in a like a um, overland vehicle that they built, and then they were down in Mexico at the time we were talking to. It's just there's so many amazing stories, and we like to hit that yeah. stuff. Not so it's just so there's a lot of podcasts already about um, different curriculums and that you can use and all that kind of stuff. And we just wanted to take it somewhere else, somewhere where the possibilities for people are endless because everyone doesn't fit into one hole when it comes to homeschooling. And a lot of times people get discouraged because they're like, well, that's not me. I, I can't be a homeschool family because that's not me. We're not that type of family. It doesn't matter what you are. You right. know, if you're just a crazy adventure family, then you can yes. homeschool your kids <laughs> like that too. And if you like sitting around your kitchen table and, and doing it that way, then that's fine too. And so we just wanted to broaden everybody's perspective, including ours, yes. with what was possible in the world. And there's the, the time that gets opened up when you homeschool your kids because of the time that they spend in school yes. is absolutely amazing. And hearing everybody's stories is just, it's very uh, uplifting for us. It's amazing. I definitely think that's an awesome uh, arena to go into, like you said, to expand 
and show the the huge you know variety and diversity in homeschooling and how people are doing it successfully in non traditional ways. And so, if uh, definitely uh, those that are listening, please. Uh, you know, look into the podcast link there and definitely listen in and support um, if you feel so led to support uh, Nathan's podcast, because definitely um, it sounds like it's just incredible. So I appreciate I appreciate your voice out there, you and your wife, Anita's uh, voice and efforts with with that podcast. Wow. Our time has come, everyone. This has been awesome. So much information. It's a topic that you just can't really get into a little bit of time, but I feel like we covered it well. Nathan answered lots of questions and Nathan gave us a real good solid grasp on what this looks like. And um, the next step to do your research, right? Definitely. Mm -hmm. And if you need any help on the consulting side, transcript reviews and all, definitely contact us. If anyone that's viewing would be interested in uh, new resources from HSLDA, just Definitely, we would love to hear you and stay connected to you. Um, so definitely do that. And so we know as military homeschool families that we face unique challenges and we can feel disconnected and forgotten. So here at HSLDA, we're working really hard to develop resources that will help you find connection and encouragement. So we maintain a growing list of homeschool groups and local support groups here in the United States and overseas as well. So if you are a leader of a military homeschool support group, please contact me, Natalie Mack, at military at hslda.org. I would love to get more of our military support groups uh, in our directory. There's also so many benefits for groups to join uh, our HSLDA group directory. And as members, you have access to a great legal team, fantastic educational consultants that can help military families and others, non-military as well, of course, through any of the questions and challenges that may come up in your homeschooling state side or overseas. So if you're not already a member, we definitely would love for you to join us. So you can find out more about membership at hslda.org forward slash join. And I think the link has been posted for that. So I want to finally say thanks so much, Nathan. Uh, This has been awesome. I appreciate and respect your time, your efforts, what you're doing Uh, as a homeschooling father, as as a fellow military and Coast Guard uh, recruiter. I just I just really appreciate and the time that you've taken. Thank you so very much for joining us and for being being my guest today on this. Thank you very much. Today's program is made possible by HSLDA's team of educational consultants. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the number of curriculum options to choose from? Or maybe you're frustrated because your child is struggling and you're not sure what to do next. Our educational consultants can help. As an HSLDA member, you have access to customized practical guidance on everything from lesson planning and record keeping to helping a child with learning difficulties. If you want to experience less frustration and more progress in your homeschool, get support from our educational consultants by becoming a member of HSLDA. Learn more at hslda.org slash join. That's hslda.org slash join. Thanks for listening to this episode of Homeschool Talks. If you enjoyed this conversation, leave a review to let us know what you think. To hear more conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to this podcast or head on over to hslda.org slash podcast for more inspiring stories and awesome ideas about homeschooling. That's all for today. We hope you enjoyed the program and we'll see you next time.